Em, I was thinking of you the other day while I was whitening my teeth. Oh, thanks. Remember a few weeks ago when you had to take the day off because you had whitened and your mouth was in so much pain? Please don't remind me. Not only did my teeth feel awful, I really didn't see that much of a difference in the whiteness. Yeah, that's why when I was using my new Brighton system, I thought of you. How sweet. Was it because your teeth hurt too? The complete opposite, actually. Brighton was super easy to use. I simply put some of the whitening gel on my teeth and placed the mouthpiece for 15 minutes. When I was done, not only did the gel not cause that whitening pain, I saw results immediately. Josh even noticed. So you got pain-free, immediate results? Not only that, but I can use it whenever my teeth need a little sprucing up? Okay, how do I get this in my life? Easy. Just go to Brighton, that's B-R-Y-T-N, smile.com, and pick your kit. And when you use promo code RAIN25, you'll get a whopping 25% off of your order. Brighton, Brighton, the the best way to whiten. This is Murder in the Rain, where each week Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough tell true crime stories of the Pacific Northwest. Murder in the Rain contains graphic content. Listener discretion is advised. In light of recent events that have completely distracted me from being productive this week, we're going to switch things up today and give you a taste of Patreon. Our Patreon members, starting at the $5 a month level, have access to two additional episodes per month. We call these minis, but they actually vary in length from about 15 minutes to 40 minutes. And we cover a variety of cases from all over the world, not just the Pacific Northwest. Today, we're going to play you one, which happens to be one that is often requested. A true crime fan favorite, if you will, the story of Hell's Princess, Belle Gunnis. In 2021, we aired an episode called X Marks the Spot, where I covered the case of Susan Monica, a trans woman who was convicted of brutally murdering two men on her farm and feeding them to her hogs. Now, at the end of that case, Alicia, you brought up how it vaguely reminded you of another famous case, Bell Gunnis, a very notorious serial killer who is thought to have murdered between 14 and 42 people between the years of 1884 and 1908. And you're right, there are definitely similarities. They were both women who knew how to live on a farm. They were able to do it alone. They're both strong and capable. They both farmed hogs. And as I suggested in the last episode, it's quite possible that Susan Monica took a note from the history of Belle Gunnis and lured men to her. So without further ado, I bring to you today one of my favorite true crime cases, the story of Belle Gunnis, the serial man killer, a woman who has been called the following nicknames, a modern Lady Macbeth. Black Widow, Laporte Ghoul, Indiana Ogress, Human Vampire, Female Bluebeard, High Priestess of Murder, Mistress of the Castle of Death, Queen of Crime, and Hell's Princess. Let's start with an anonymous poem published in Harold Schechter's book, Hell's Princess. This is titled The Ballad of Bell Gunnis. Belle Gunnis was a lady fair in Indiana State. She weighed about 300 pounds, and that is quite some weight. That she was stronger than a man her neighbors all did own. She butchered hogs right easily and did it all alone. But hogs were just a sideline she indulged in now and then. Her favorite occupation was a butchering of men. Belle Gunnis was born Brynhild Paulstadter Storseth, and the birthday most historians agree on is November 11, 1859. She was the youngest child born to parents Paul and Barrett Storseth in Selbu, Norway, Like many families at that time, the store sets were a large family, and Belle was the youngest of eight children. A story was aired on an Irish television show that described Brynhild going through something very traumatic that impacted her deeply. 
According to Ann Vespi, Brynhild had a major personality change after going to a dance at the age of 18. It's thought that at the time she was pregnant and was attacked by a wealthy man, presumably the father, who kicked her in the stomach, which caused a miscarriage. A few years after the incident in 1881, Brynhild, who had now changed her name to Belle, followed in her sister Nellie's footsteps and decided to immigrate to the United States. Many Norwegians were immigrating here in the 19th century, and Belle had been saving for this for years. At the age of 14, she started working at local farms, herding and milking cattle, in the hopes that someday she'd be able to afford the passage to the country Norwegians dreamed about starting their own successful lives in. Belle's dream came true, and she made her way to the U.S. and moved in with her sister Nellie and her husband in Chicago. She started working as a maid before getting a job at a butcher shop. Before long, she met her future husband, Mad Sorensen, who worked as a department store detective. Did you know they had such a thing? A department store detective? I think it's just like security, right? It is, but um, yes, I did know that because a local radio show we used to have, one of the guys used to do that. And that's basically so cool. it's it's more like you're the one that's like following people around or like watching people sneak things into their bags so you get to so do, you do get more it. Snoopy stuff. Ooh, <laughs> sounds fun. On July 30th, 1884, Belle and Mads got married. This is the time in the story that most believe Belle started blossoming into her dark persona that would eventually collect all those nicknames. The first of two rapid succession fires occurred shortly after starting her life with Mads. The first fire took their home, which filled their pockets with insurance money. This money helped fund their next venture, a confectionery store in Chicago on Grand Avenue and Elizabeth Street. Within a year of being open, the business ended up in flames, and it also paid out even more insurance money. Weird. Weird how that works. Now, rumor has it somebody had told her in passing about how they collected insurance due to a fire, and that maybe, like, planted a seed, mm. but that's not... I can't find that documented right. anywhere. Hard I just to know I've heard from that. so long ago. Right, exactly. I know I've heard it over the years. But even if someone didn't, she figured it out. If you had it happen one time and you go, huh, well, that, wasn't well, that too worked bad. out. <laughs> After this loss, the couple moved to Austin, Illinois, where they bought a house and began their family. Now, Belle and Mads had trouble getting pregnant, so they ended up welcoming foster children. The couple had a total of four children together, Axel, Caroline, Lucy, and Myrtle. As they had trouble conceiving, it's thought that all four of these children were fostered and or adopted. But it's a little bit unclear. However, we do know that both Axel and Caroline died as babies from what was noted as acute colitis. Acute colitis is an inflammation of the lining of the colon, and this is caused by an infection or a chemical irritant. Ooh. Symptoms include diarrhea, pain and cramping, rectal bleeding, weight loss, fever, canker sores, and fatigue. And usually this lasts about a week and goes away, and the mortality rate of this is really low, yet both of these children died of it. Of course, both of these children had also been insured, so upon their deaths, Mads and Belle received money, and both children were laid to rest in their family plot in Forest Home Cemetery. Sometime around 1900, another 10-year-old girl joined the family. I'm unsure of the name that this child was actually born with. Some suggest that it was Morgan Couch, but she went by the name of Jenny Olson. More death would soon follow for the Sorensen family. Mad Sorensen would die on July 30th, 1900. Now, this is an interesting one. Multiple doctors came to examine him. The first believed he was suffering from strychnine poisoning, but the Sorensen family doctor claimed that he had been treating him for an enlarged heart, and he was giving him medication for that, and he was most certainly dead because of his enlarged heart. Now, they chose not to do an autopsy, despite the fact that they had differing opinions, so we're not really sure. And of course, insurance paid out. That's the 1800s for you, baby. Suspiciously, he had life insurance under one company and then changed companies and purchased another. And these two plans would overlap by a single day. And what do you know? That was the day he died. So not just one insurance claim, but two were paid out. And you guys, I blew right through this the first time, but I like to check my dates right before we record. And I realized when I checked them, this day he died also happened to be their sixth wedding anniversary. 
Very suspicious. Getting suspicious. Mad's family was now completely suspicious of Belle, and it seemed that the first doctor's suggestion of poisoning lingered with them. They not only believed that it was the case, but that it was for the sole purpose of getting his insurance money. They went to the police and an inquest was ordered, but it doesn't appear that anything was ever done in pursuit of it because Mads was never exhumed and Bell was given nearly $9,000. That amount of money would be nearly $300,000 today. Bell, now a newly single mom and her three daughters, pick up and move to LaPorte, Indiana in 1901, and she used the money to purchase a 48-acre farm on McClung Road. During this move, she met a man named Peter Gunnis from her home country of Norway. The pair begin a romance, and it seems like the perfect match. He's a widower and a father of two young girls. On April 1st, 1902, the pair was married. One week after they got married, Peter's youngest daughter, an infant, died mysteriously. She had been alone in the home with Belle, and her death was noted as uncertain causes. And not long after the baby's death, Peter suffered his own horrible fate. I wonder if she chose the wedding date. April Fool. Oh. Mother Fooler. Was that even a thing back then? I don't do some quick research on that. I don't know when, when that did started. April Fools? Well, yeah. it goes back to the change to the Gregorian calendar, so it's probably pretty is Oh right. boy, you sound like me. <laughs> I don't I don't think they did a whole lot of fooling in nineteen oh whatever. You all die young yeah. back then. Step on a nail, you're dead. Yep. Catch a cold. You did. Thank you. English pranksters began popularizing the annual tra- annual tradition of April Fool's Day in the 1700s. Wow. Thank you. But Norwegians are a very, like, well, stoic. I don't, I don't know many of them, but yeah. <laughs> we, we don't do pranks. <laughs> Tragedy would strike once again on December 16th, 1902, eight months after the two had been married. Bell detailed to someone, not sure if it was the doctor or the police, but there is a written record that she told someone Peter was in the kitchen while she was cooking. He reaches out for his slippers, which were for some reason next to the stove. And as he does so, he accidentally gets scalded by what she's cooking, which was brine. And then simultaneously, the meat grinder falls off of a shelf onto his head and he dies at the age of 30. She, of course, gains $3,000 of insurance money for his death, but the town is now talking. No one really believed her husband would have been the victim to so many random accidents because he's like running a hog farm. He's an experienced butcher. He's just not someone who would be careless around things like stoves and meat grinders. That whole setup sounds like Pee Wee's house. I know. Like, put your slippers on the counter next to the boiling thing, and, and then you pull on that, and then this the is going to bang Oopsie. on your head. And, and also, who puts a meat grinder, like, up high? They're heavy and big. Like, mm-mm-mm. Mm, s- I'm not buying it, is what I'm saying. It's fishy. One witness claims to have overheard Jenny, the adopted daughter who's now 14 at the time, telling a school friend, quote, my mama killed my papa. She hit him with a meat cleaver and he died. Don't tell a soul. They, of course, told the authorities. The district coroner believed Peter Gunnis had been murdered, so he put together a jury to take a look at the case. Jenny was asked to go before the jury to talk about the remark she made, and she, of course, denied it. She said, I never said that. Despite all the hoopla, Bell was able to convince the coroner, who apparently has like all the authority at the time, uh, that she's innocent. So once the autopsy was complete, they deemed the cause of death inconclusive. So she's off the hook. And I suppose that's good for her because she's pregnant. Within that year, Peter's brother came to the farm to take his remaining daughter, Svon Hilda, back with him to Wisconsin and away from Bell Gunnis. And that's likely so she could remain alive since everyone was questioning if this woman was a black widow at this point, which, as you will find out, was a very smart move. In May of 1903, Belle gave birth to a baby boy she named Philip. And yes, it is believed Philip is the son of her late husband, Peter. When Peter is about three years old, people begin to notice that Jenny is no longer spotted around the farm or in town. And Belle starts telling her neighbors that little Jenny, her foster daughter, is all grown up and moved out to begin her own life by going out into the world and getting an education at Lutheran College in Los Angeles. This seems like a very normal thing to do, so no one questions why they never see Jenny again. 
Now, after Peter's death, Belle is running her farm and raising three children and putting one through college. And during this, she starts posting advertisements in newspapers. This is what Alicia and I were talking about in terms of similarities to Susan Monica. It's hard work to have a successful farm, and I think it's pretty much unheard of to do it on your own. And while Belle Gunnis needed help, she also needed financial security and a life partner. Unlike Susan Monica, who asked for a farmhand to help her build her house, Belle had a more unique situation. Let me read you one of the ads she posted in the matrimonial column of the Chicago Daily News. I'm sorry, matrimonial column? Yes, there was an actual column. I'm guessing that's where they announced marriages and things, right? Yeah, but well, you could also post things and be like, Mama Thirsty. Yeah, here, here you go. <sighs> Personal. Comely widow who owns a large farm in one of the finest districts in LaPorte County, Indiana, desires to make the acquaintance of a gentleman equally well provided. With view of joining fortunes, no replies by letter considered unless sender is willing to follow answer with personal visit. Triflers need not apply. Surprisingly, many men wrote to her. This sounded like a pretty sweet deal to them. First, there was John Moe, who was a Norwegian immigrant, and he came to her from Elbow Lake, Minnesota, and he meant business. After writing her, he arrived with over $1,000 on hand. He offered to pay off her mortgage in return to join forces in marriage. However, after being at the farm for only a week, no one saw John again. Then came George Anderson from Missouri, also a Norwegian immigrant. He discussed a similar deal with Belle over the dinner table. He would pay off her mortgage and the two would marry. They had an agreement until later that night when Anderson woke up to her standing over him while he slept. She had a candle in her hand and a creepy look on her face, and then she ran out of the room. So he followed suit, got out of there like super quickly, and got on a train back to Missouri. Creepy, right? Horrific. On April 6, 1907, Ole B. Budsberg was seen in Laporte Savings Bank mortgaging his Wisconsin land and signing over the lease in exchange for cash. Ole was an elderly widower who came from Lola, Wisconsin to, you guessed it, answer Bell's ad. No one ever saw him again. His son only discovered that his father went to the Gunnis farm after rifling through his letters to learn of his destination. He even wrote to Bell, who replied and said, oh, he was never here. Another man, Andrew Higelin from Aberdeen, South Dakota, exchanged several letters with Bell. Bell wrote to him to tell him she looked forward to meeting him, a man she described in letters as, quote, the sweetest man in the whole world. She told him she not only loved him, but alluded to their being together in marriage. He then visited her in January of 1908 and with him brought his entire life savings. She deposited the $2,900 check, but he was nowhere to be seen within days of his arrival. While Andrew was the last to answer her ads, there were, of course, dozens of other men before him that were known to visit the Gunnis farm and were never seen again. I'm not sure what kind of validity there is to this, but more than one farmer claimed to have gone past Bell's farm late in the night and would see her digging holes in the hog pen. In retrospect, it's probably true. I mean, she was doing that, but was that a story that came out of it after they kind of learned? I don't know. Yeah, was it like, oh, I heard people saw her digging in the hog pen. Was it when they were already digging on the property and learned of what she had done, or was that actually something that happened? I don't know. But yeah, she was probably doing exactly what they think she was doing. The Hit Pop Culture Podcast Spectacle is back, and host Mariah Smith is dissecting a messy obsession with true crime. Why do we fall asleep to Dateline or can't get enough of Ted Bundy documentaries? Why do so many of us love to unwind with true crime? And what does this fascination with murder say about us? The newest season digs into that and so much more. From Neon Hum Media and Sony Music Entertainment, subscribe to Spectacle True Crime. Listen wherever you get your podcasts. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp. Life can be overwhelming, and many people are burned out without even knowing it. 
For myself, the last few years have brought relationship strain along with the realization I've been struggling with anxiety and other mental health issues, all of which I need therapeutic assistance in processing. I've always been a strong supporter of therapy, not only for myself, but for friends and family. With staffing shortages and therapists being booked out for months, I've recommended using BetterHelp. BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to prioritize yourself. Talking with someone can help you figure out what's causing stress in your life and how to manage it in a healthy way. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist, so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Our listeners can get 10% off their first month at BetterHelp.com slash Murder in the Rain. That's BetterHelp.com slash Murder in the Rain. Typically, it didn't seem like many people took notice of Bell's suitors over the years. No one seemed to care that men would empty their bank accounts, sell their houses, and move their entire life to be with some woman from the newspaper. But more than that, they didn't seem to notice that the men disappeared forever. And while a few families inquired by letter when their loved one wouldn't return home, it seemed like only one man was truly invested in learning the truth. Andrew Higelin's brother, Isla, hadn't seen his brother in some time and noticed when suddenly much of his brother's wealth was deposited in Indiana. After growing incredibly concerned when his brother didn't come home after visiting Belle, he wrote to her to find out where he was. She said that Andrew had already left and that he likely went to Norway to visit their family because he often talked about that. Isla didn't believe this, so he wrote her again, outlining that he believed he was still in Laporte. She replied and said, fine, come look for him. But it might be expensive to go on a search for a man, and if he wanted her help, he would have to pay her. The audacity. She's ballsy. I know. He did eventually make his way out there in May of 1908, but by then things were ablaze, quite literally. After Andrew's disappearance and while she was having regular correspondence with Andrew's brother, Belle also began having problems with another man named Ray Lamphere. Bell had hired Ray to work on her farm, and of course, what's a murder story without a strange, unrequited love so cue Ray, who was in love with Bell Gunnis? Ray dedicated himself to Bell, but grew increasingly jealous with every suitor that visited her farm. Finally, she had enough of Ray and fired him February 3rd, 1908. She immediately goes to town and speaks to the court, and she's intent on everyone knowing that Ray was harassing her and that he was basically mentally unstable. She was able to spin such tales of Ray's behavior that authorities actually held a sanity hearing. The hearing is held, and they deem him sane and allow him to leave, but Belle keeps going back to the sheriff to say Ray is going to her farm and arguing with her. He's threatening her and her family. So police had no choice but to arrest him for trespassing. Ray also began to loosen his lips around what kind of things were happening on the farm. One night, he told another farmer, a man by the name of William Slater, that, quote, Higeline won't bother me no more. We fixed him for keeps. Could it be that Belle not only hired Ray to help on the farm, but to help her dispose of the men she killed for their money? Bell told anyone that would listen that she feared for her life when it came to Ray Lamphere. In fact, she was so scared that she decided to have a will drafted so if he did do something to her, her money wouldn't just go to waste. So in her will, she left her entire estate to her children. And after that, she paid off the remaining mortgage to her farm, which she kept trying to get the suitors to do. Interesting. And then she made sure to go to her lawyer and say, I'm scared Ray's going to kill me and then light my house on fire. Very specific. Very specific. Very specific. That's nice of Ray to specifically threaten her. (laughs) I'm going to get you, lady, and then I'm going to light your house on fire. On April 28, 1908, Joe Maxson, the farmhand that was hired to replace Ray after he was fired, awoke to find that the Gunnis house was ablaze. His room was full of smoke. Now, he's unable to get to all the rooms in the house, so he's screaming for the family in the hopes that they hear him and wake up and realize there's a fire and get out of the home. He himself had to jump out of a second-story window wearing only his underwear to escape getting burned alive. Now, after the fires put out, it was clear that not everyone made it out alive. Four human bodies were discovered in the wreckage of the home. 
The bodies of the Gunnis children were found still in their beds, and the body of a woman was also found. However, she was missing her head. While it initially looked like the children died in their beds, there was evidence that suggested all four bodies had been in the basement. So it was thought that they died of homicide and then they were staged throughout the house. Immediately, the sheriff was fixated on Ray Lamphere, who had been harassing Belle and her family. It was obvious he had finally gone a step further, attacked Belle and killed her, beheaded her, and then lit the house on fire to cover it all up and kill the children. All because she likely didn't return his affection. Their suspicions were all but proved correct when a witness came forward, a young man named John, who said he had been watching the Gunnis home and saw Ray running from the house as it went up in flames. And Ray Lamphere is now arrested for arson and murder. It's a little odd he was watching the house, don't you think? I don't know what that uh, means. I don't know. You know, arsonists are, you know... They're kind of pervy about no, no, it. No, no, like this kid, this kid John. Oh, is the, like, oh, the, oh, yeah, he I went saw by. Him I was just watching the house. <laughs> I don't know what that oh, means. Oh, yeah, that is okay. Maybe he lived back. at like a neighboring farm and was just happened to see the fire. Yeah, or say I was walking down the road and I saw him running out or yeah, something. Yeah, there wasn't a lot of detail. I'm guessing they just noted whatever. Yeah, kid witness it. The sheriff begins the tedious task of searching the home, totally destroyed by arson, for evidence of the murders that took place there. Just days into the investigation, Andrew Hegeling's brother, Isla, arrives. He goes straight to the sheriff to tell him that he believes his brother met a tragic fate at the hands of Bell Gunnis. To add more validity to his claims, the new farmhand, Joe Maxson, also comes forward and tells them about how he was asked to bring several large loads of dirt to the hog pen. There were several holes that needed to be filled, and when he asked Belle what they were filling it for, she was just like, oh, they're full of garbage. So on She's May- full of garbage. <laughs> I mean, no questions asked. He's just getting paid to work yeah, on exactly. the farm. But now that this guy's like, uh, my brother's missing, and I'm yeah. pretty sure she did it, he's like, wait a mm. minute. There were a few mm. suspicious holes. So on May 3rd, 1908, they began to dig. The entire town gravitated to the Gunnis Farm to watch what unfolded. There were even extra trains scheduled from Chicago to Indianapolis to support all of the people that were coming into town with morbid curiosity just to see what they might find on the Gunnis Farm. It seemed like each shovel full of dirt uncovered a new body. The first body that was found was Andrew Hegeling. It seemed like his brother was right all along. Not far from him was the body of Jenny Olson, who never actually went to California for school. Hour after hour, other remains were found until they had the bodies of 12 people and a bunch of miscellaneous bones from several other individuals. Over the days that they found the bodies, a morgue was set up on the farm so that all of the people who were watching this could actually see all of the bones being uncovered and moved to this, like, tent right there on the property. So they could just, like, go and look at them. And this picture was taken. It's this famous photo of the investigation that was turned into a postcard that people could send their friends and family. I was there. Yeah. It's all over the Internet. I can't wait. I'll post it with this. (laughs) As if the discovery of multiple bodies on the Gunnis farm wasn't enough drama, there's still another soap opera unfolding. And this, my friends, is why this case is one of my longtime favorites. So when the bodies were discovered in the house, it was clear that the children were in fact the Gunnis children as they were fully recognizable. However, there were questions about Belle. The body that was supposedly Belle's was missing her head, and there were plenty of people who didn't believe it was hers. Belle Gunnis, at minimum, was 5 feet 8 inches tall, and she weighed between 180 and 200 pounds. Some accounts say she was 5'9 and 210. This was corroborated by several dressmakers who had her measurements on file. Now, the body found in the house was wearing her clothing, but taking the addition of a head into account, it was still missing several inches of height. The body discovered in the house was about five foot three. So you'd have to have like a big ass forward forehead to make up like five inches. Yeah, that's a lot. (laughs) That's like impossible. Also, the body only weighed about 150 pounds, which would be like a 30 pound difference overnight, which is impossible. I do believe the human head weighs eight pounds. 
So that's still 20 plus pounds. Yeah, that's a problem. What are you saying? It wasn't her oh. body. So many people were vocal that it was not her. Local farmers she interacted with regularly and a bunch of people from Chicago who knew her from before, they all come to view the body and they're like, nope, that's impossible. That's not her. Roughly three weeks later, on May 19th, a discovery was made, a piece of bridge work containing human canines with their roots attached and gold crown work. These were confirmed to be bells by her dentist, Dr. Ira Norton. This discovery led the coroner to conclude that the body in the house was in fact Belle because, you know, there's a small body with no head, but hey, her teeth are over here, so it must be her. That's tough, though, because it's like from the root. So that's like, out. I mean, I don't even know if you got, you know, if you got Maybe hit. Maybe like a shovel. Yeah, if you got hit, could that do it by the root? But then it's like, yeah, did you pull it out just to do that? Or, oh, oh, that's a tough one. That's what I think. Now, everyone around is certain Belle Gunness is a murderous, man-luring seductress. But everyone's safe now that she's dead, right? And Ray Lamphere, who is possibly her confidant and co-conspirator, is sitting awaiting trial to learn of his own fate. Ray's trial begins in November of 1908. At the heart of Ray's defense is that he had no involvement in the murder of the Gunness family or the arson that destroyed their home, was that Belle Gunness's body was not found in that house and that she had gotten away. His lawyer, Wirt Warden, was a boss. He brought in a local jeweler who testified that the bridge work wouldn't have survived the high heats of a fire. In fact, they replicated this shit. They reenacted the conditions. Two doctors were able to take a human jaw with a similar dental piece into a blacksmith's forge and the teeth totally disintegrated, what was left were all burned and pocked, and the gold was totally melted. This proved that the teeth would have had to have been put in the house after the fire was extinguished because they were in near perfect condition, and they hadn't been found for three weeks, even though they had searched the property daily. So now again, Joe Maxson comes forward. This is Ray's replacement, and he says, yeah, this guy named Klondike Schultz, was helping with the excavation, he actually planted the evidence. He saw him take it out of his pocket and leave it on the property. So this argument worked. The murder charges against Ray were dropped. However, he was found guilty of arson. The judge sentenced him to 2 to 21 years in prison, and he was fined $6,000. He was sent to spend his sentence in the Indiana State Prison. And sadly, he only lived to see another year. Ray died from tuberculosis on December 30th, 1909. For the duration of his sentence, he continued to insist that the body found in the house was not Belle, that she was still alive and she got away with murder due to her ingenious plot and his help. Furthermore, she killed not just 12 people, but 42. Many believe, like myself, that he was her pawn all along. Bell Gunness used the fact that he was in love with her to get his help with the arson and help pin himself as the murderer. A month after Ray's death, his reverend comes forward and claims that while he was dying, Ray made a confession, and this would help explain everything. He swore to him that Bell was still alive and that he never helped her murder anyone, but he did help her bury the victims. He also helped her get away and lit the house on fire. He went on to describe that each time a suitor would arrive, she would charm him, cook him a delicious meal, and usually drug him or poison him with strychnine in their after-dinner coffee. Other times, she might go to his room while he slept and use chloroform on their face. She would then disassemble their bodies using her cultivated butchering skills, and Ray even said that sometimes she would feed the victims to the hogs. When pressed a bit further on why he was sure the body wasn't Belle's, he said that Belle had just hired a maid, a woman from Chicago, and she was going to live in their home as their housekeeper. The night of the fire, she poisoned the woman, dressed her in her clothes, and beheaded her. And then she took the head, weighed it down, and tossed it into a nearby swamp. He also said that Belle had chloroformed her own children and smothered them to death. He admitted that he did help her get on a train in a neighboring town and then return to her home to light the house on fire. And in case there was any remaining question, 
The doctor who examined the bodies of the children and women found in the home sent their stomach contents to Chicago to be reviewed by a pathologist, and they later confirmed that all of them, including the woman, had lethal doses of strychnine present in their bodies, which sounds very familiar, the mm-hmm. strychnine. There have been several unconfirmed sightings of Belle Gunness over the years. She was spotted in Chicago, in New York, in L.A., and the last sighting was decades later in 1931 when someone claimed to have seen her in Mississippi. Now, you guys, I think this is totally plausible. She would have had the means to get away. So if Ray Lamphere was right and there were 42 victims, she would have made, at minimum, $1,000 per victim. And now Ray is also saying that some of those men had brought, like, thirty grand with them. Right. So they were estimating about $250,000 would have been in her possession, which would be about $7 million today. And when the house fire occurred, Bell's bank account had a little bit of money in it. They did check that. But the bank said, oh, she withdrew mostly everything days prior. Oh, so I mean, that's a huge off. clue. And I mean, Ray's sitting here saying, like, I'm in love with her. Yes, I did. I lit the house on fire, but I also helped her get away. Mm-hmm. She probably pulled out her teeth and then seduced another man to drop them on the property. Yeah. Now, in fairly recent years, November of 2007, I do remember this vividly. The body discovered in the Gunnis home was exhumed. Her sister's descendants gave them permission. So a team of anthropologists were going to study the remains do DNA analysis, and they were going to compare it to known DNA of Bell's from the letters that she would mail. okay. But unfortunately, there was not enough DNA on the letters to do the comparison. So I'm hoping someday in the future we'll know the truth. But in 1931, there was a sighting in Los Angeles. Okay, no, it wasn't a sighting. So this woman gets arrested in Los Angeles for poisoning a man that she was taking care of to get $2,000 from his bank account. She goes to prison and dies there. And then two people from LaPorte, Indiana, go to see her corpse. And they're like, that's Belle Gunness. That's her. So that everyone thinks she died in 1931, but that she got away with the murder of 42 people. Can we exhume that body for DNA? I know. I I mean, I don't know I mean, information I don't mean, on that. I'll have to I look into that. I don't know what we could compare it to, but like something. Uh, Also, I had to share this with you because this is a funny little quote. So they're talking about how, how could a woman do this? And this, the farmers and the people that knew her were like, this bitch is strong, right? And so this guy is like, yeah, I helped her with all these trunks. These trunks were coming from out of town, likely the suitors. And so he would bring them in on his cart. His name is Clyde Sturgis. And she would just lift them up and toss them around. And he said, quote, Lift like boxes of marshmallows. <laughs> and I just thought that was so funny. And then also, uh, I didn't know this. Bluebeard is a French folk tale about a man who marries and then kills them over and over and over again. Oh, so I didn't know that either. that's why she was like the called Bluebeard. Bluebeard. I had no idea either. That's interesting. I mean, funny? I love that she's referred to as like the first Craigslist killer. Yeah. Because she is. I, and how I, did she get away with that? It's just insane. Like back in the day. I'm doing my story from the 1920s, and it's like you literally could drive an hour away, and, just, yeah. and you go, "Hello, my, my my name is Fred Smith, and this is where I'm from." And you had no oh, yeah, documentation. There, there's hardly any documentation. Like I like I'm shocked that guy found out his brother's money was yeah. gone. Uh, it must have been like it, because it was a check they had record. But yeah, I mean, you really could get get out of any anything. And she was this woman. So she got away with a yeah. lot more even. I feel like this would have been such an interesting group of men because it's, I don't know, 50-50, but like in my brain, I picture half of them being almost like the guys on 90 Day Fiance, just desperate to desperate. be married and desperate mm-hmm. to have somewhere to live and or desperate to the money. Or awkward maybe, or they're, yeah. they're divorced. And they're like, oh, that sounds nice. And then the other half is someone reading, oh, a widow. Oh, a farm. Oh, like a con She's man. She's going to be easy uh-huh. to steal from. Oh, I bet I could mm-hmm. make a real nice life for myself off of this old lady. But she offers a lot to study about a female serial killer. She embodies it with the whole act of poisoning. Mm-hmm. That was her go-to method, which women are traditionally mm-hmm. the yeah, ones that poison. Separate. Yeah, but the fact that I'm positive she got away. Yeah. That's why I love this case. Yeah. Well, and interesting, too, whatever happened when she was 18. 
I mean, all of that yeah. I would think would be very formative. It sounds like oh, he took advantage of her wealthy guy mm-hmm. with this young teen, and then wouldn't marry her, wanted to get rid of the baby. Trauma can make you snap and make you see things differently and yeah. be really cold and go, okay, I got what I needed from you. Mm-hmm. Well, and then they talk about when she went to Chicago and wanted to, you know, make her new life. She was working as a maid like a lot of people from Norway would do at the time really really hard work Mm -hmm. and for these rich families and most people would work hard to like build their own life all she was seeing was I want to be one of these rich people I will do anything it takes how do I do that the fastest and easiest way and she was smart she was a smart lady so she started uh, insurance scams which how did they not catch on that that's crazy like, wow, you've really claimed a lot of insurance things in the last 10 years. And I think it was the one with the, the bakery confectionery store. They they even asked her, like, how did the fire start? She's like, oh, that lamp fell over and broke and lit the fire. And there was no evidence of a lamp. So it's like they were asking the person what started the fire because They're nobody, like, mm, fire science good. wasn't a thing. Yeah. Bless that brother who didn't give up. He Spent yeah, months and months and months trying to catch her in her lies. I would think all of that would be so hard to do because in the 1800s, if I just packed a bag and got my stuff and left. Well, and I have to say, if it hadn't been for him, who knows what would have happened to Ray? Yeah. Because that was added evidence for him. I bet Ray would have been around for quite some time because she needed him. Yeah, and I he... think he turned on her and was like, I don't want to do this anymore. And she had to get rid of that problem. Yeah. But she utilized his affection and obsession towards her to be like, oh, okay. Oh, you know what? I could use some help around the farm Mm -hmm. in like hiding murders and stuff. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Well, it's a fascinating one. That's the story of Belle Gunness, which I'm glad you brought up with the last case because, you know, I love this story. I know. I'm glad you finally got to cover it. Yay. This money helped fund their next venture, a confectionery store in Chicago on Grab. Oh, my God. I did it again. Grand Abdo. <laughs> Both children were laid to rest in their family. F- oh, boy. <laughs> Got them camping lips. <laughs> we all know what that means. <laughs> snoring. I was snoring real loud. Because <laughs> the baby she had later won him. <gasps> So it's him. Yes. Clutch those pearls. <laughs> <laughs> they not only believe that that was the case, but it was the sole purpose. Nope. <laughs> Written record. <laughs> Get those demons oh, out. God. Swan Hilda. Yeah, that's her name. Swan. 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 Swan Hilda. Mm-hmm. Like Brunhilde, but with a bird. And they're all named Hilda something. Oh, yep. You're welcome. Me. Well, gurgle burp. They had an agreement until later that night when he woke up and he wo- la, 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 la. came from Lola, Wisconsin. And you guessed it. Nope, I didn't finish the sentence. Another man, Andrew Hegelin from Aberde- Aberdeen. <laughs> oh, boy. Aberdeen. Hegelin for Aberdeen. <laughs> Dozens of other men before him. And hold on. That was a longer sentence than I alluded to. <laughs> <laughs> I know I made it seem like it was shorter. Trick. There's a comma. <laughs> April Fool's. The hearings is blah, not blah. Well, in such an interesting group, these men must have be must have be must have be must have be. Murder in the Rain is a Cascade Media production, written and hosted by Emily Rowney, Alicia Holland, and Josh McCullough, edited by Josh McCullough. You can always contact us at murderintherain at gmail.com or through our website, murderintherain.com. If you just can't get enough of Murder in the Rain, for as little as $5 a month, you'll have exclusive access to bonus episodes at patreon.com. You can find us on all of the socials, and for more true crime, follow at M underscore Murder in the Rain on TikTok, and you can also listen to Alicia and Josh on their other show, Always Be My Sisters. And suck my balls. <laughs>